I V M. The year is 1856. Charles Canning becomes the Governor General. A law was passed to allow Hindu widows to remarry. Bal Gangadhar Tilak was born. And most importantly, something happened that would change the history of India. A bill called the Nawab of Surat Treaty Bill was introduced on 7th July in the British Parliament. What is this bill? What did it have to do with the history of India? That is what we will be discussing in this episode of States of Anarchy. Hi, you're listening to States of Anarchy, a podcast on global affairs, foreign policy and international relations. I'm your host Hamsini Hariharan. I want you to think about Surat. Honestly, till today I have never devoted any time or thought to Surat. The only thing that your 10th standard history book would have told you is that the East India ships first docked at Surat and that the British first set their factory up there. But at one point in time, Surat was one of the most cosmopolitan plural cities in the world and it has an important place also in the maritime history of the world. The story that takes place here is about a 26 year old man Mir Jafar Ali Khan the nawab of Surat in the 19th century in 1853 Mir Jafar made a one month trip all the way to Britain from India he raised a private member bill against the excesses of the English East India Company he wins and a year later in 1857 the reign of the East India Company ends and that's when the british crown takes over india My guest for today is the perfect person to narrate the story. Mir Moin is the author of Surat: Fall of a Port, Rise of a Prince. He also has a personal connection to the story. He's a descendant of the Nawabs of Surat. Before we dive into the conversation, let's first take a short break. Hello everybody, welcome to another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. If you're not following us on social media, please make sure you do. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. This is a really exciting week. We've got two really big shows releasing this week. The first show is Dreaming with Your Eyes Open with Ronnie Screwwala. This is a companion podcast to Ronnie's best-selling book, Dream with Your Eyes Open. On this podcast, Ronnie shares his vast entrepreneurial experience and takeaways from each chapter with me. New episodes will be out every Tuesday, and also don't forget to listen to the audio book. The audio book is available for free on our website and a whole bunch of other platforms. You'll find it wherever you look for it. The second show that we're really excited about is called The Note with famous journalist and news editor Maru Kinayat. She cuts the clutter and analyzes the stories that matter to you. Join her on the podcast where she gives you pure analysis on what's happening around you. This week she has a three-part exclusive series about the Indian elections. Speaking of the Indian elections, also check out the latest episode of Thale Harate Simplified Ganatantra The Scene and the Unseen Election Soundtrack and Cyrus says his cock and bull for our thoughts on the elections. On the scene in the unseen, Namit Verma talks to David Bose, executive VP of the Cato Institute, about being a libertarian in 2019 and how to deal with the resurgence of fascism and authoritarianism in politics. On Pesa Vesa, Anupam talks to Mohan Jairaman, regional managing director at Experian Asia Pacific, about credit scores and everything you need to know about them. On Geek Fruit, thinker Jishnu and Janam break down DC's latest entry into the DC universe, Shazam. On IVM Likes, the IVM staffers are joined by video producer Gauri Pandit to geek out over Game of Thrones. They talk at length about the final season, fan theories about the show's ending, whether the books will ever follow up, and a lot more. On Dating is Garbage, post an episode that discusses marriage. It's time to discuss live-in relationships. Kavya Bekter joins the team to throw some light on arguments often raised against living in. And with that, let's get you on with your shows. Welcome back to States of Anarchy. I'm Hamsini Hariharan, and I'm in conversation with Meer Moin. Hi, Meer. Thank you for speaking with me. Surat for the British came in the 16th century and the 15th century was a bustling port city, right? But now it's diamonds. What was it then? Well, um, Surat uh, uh, between the uh, well through the entire 1600s uh, and 1700s, so for let's say 200 years, uh, and even you know large parts of the 1500s. So let's say approximately 250 years. Uh, was um, you know India's most glorious port. Uh, it attracted quite like a magnet uh, merchants from all parts of the world. You know Armenians, yeah. Jews, Chalabi Turks, Hindus, Jains, Muslims, and if you if you have a fertile imagination, you can think about what kind of port this must have been, bursting with color and fragrance and all kinds of people. Forget about Bombay. I mean, you know, think about. 17th century Surat as this incredibly eclectic city. 
um, and <clears throat> all these incredible merchants traded, uh, you know, in bullion. They traded in spices, in cotton, and then you had the European mix of the Portuguese, the Dutch, the English. Uh, so Surat, as Sir Thomas Rowe put it, who, who landed up and who you know besieged Emperor Jahangir for a trading license, uh, he called Surat uh, the fountain of all Eastern trade. Yeah. And um, you know Leo Tolstoy writes about the cafes of Surat being even better than the ones in Venice. So you know I know you probably would not imagine that <laughs> when if you visited Surat now. But I I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I remember reading that Ptolemy had at some point mentioned that Surat was a city that he wanted to go to. I think that's very true. And uh, so you know th this was the kind of you know extravagant mix of merchants, traders people doing business. Um, so through the 1600s and all the way to the 1700s, so that's 200 years, uh, Surat was India's symbol of um, maritime trade. Uh, the river Tapti was, was the spine on which India's maritime trade was built. Yeah, so I think we need to take a little step back. Uh, Surat was forcibly annexed by... Uh, the English East India Company in the year 1800. Um, and it was forcibly annexed because uh, Richard Wellesley flexed his muscles, sent in his regiments um, into the palace of the old fading Nawab, you know, who didn't really have a military. And Richard Wellesley was doing this on the back of an incredible and monumental victory over Tipu Sultan. And there was no way in, in you know, in the world that the Nawab Nasiruddin of Surat could actually challenge the military might of Richard Wellesley. So uh, Nawab Nasiruddin was forced to sign away his ruling powers. But the treaty that was signed was that the descendants of the Nawab would be paid a pension of 15,000 pounds for perpetuity mm -hmm. from generation to generation. And he would be allowed to keep his estates. Mm -hmm. The estates itself were approximately a third of Surat. Uh, they included seven palaces, uh, enormous amounts of gardens, orchards, and it provided an extraordinary amount of employment. You know, they were weavers, they were craftsmen, they were textile manufacturers, they were uh, potters, you know, they were gardeners, they were horticulturists, they were stable boys. In 1842, the Nawab Afzaluddin dies, okay. and before he dies, he officially adopts Mir Jafar Ali Khan because he does not have a um, son. Okay. And not only does he adopt Mir Jafri Khan, he gets Mir Jafri Khan married to his sickly daughter. Mm -hmm. And he's and his strategy is pretty clear that if the English East India Company, who have had a treacherous track record of violating treaties, do not accept his daughter as the uh, successor, they will have to accept his adopted son. Mm -hmm. If they don't accept the adopted son, they will have to accept the daughter. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he dies a peaceful death, uh, although in his opium den, thinking that he secured his states. Mm -hmm. Now, the English East India Company in 1842, on the death of Afzaluddin, yeah. refused to recognize Mir Jafri Khan, the adopted son, and they refused to recognize the daughter, who is also his wife, um, as the heirs to the, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to, the, to the estates. And they illegally throw the family out of the estates, confine them to a minuscule, you know, kind of a studio apartment mm -hmm. and illegally put up all those estates for a public auction. That leads to an incredible amount of unemployment for all those weavers and craftsmen and potters and gardeners who are just told to leave. And it leaves Mir Jafar Ali Khan and his infant daughters on the brink of destitution. All right. Okay, explain something to me. If... At this point in time, um, Jahangir was still at the throne? No. At no. this point in time, uh, the Mughal Empire has collapsed. All right. uh, there is still a titular uh, ruler in Delhi, hmm. Akbar Shah II, who is the father of the last emperor, Bahadur Shah Zafar. All right. So Bahadur Shah Zafar's father hmm. uh, is, in, is in power. And so, you know, Bahadur Shah Zafar is also going to take power sooner. Or later, by the 1850s, when Mir Jafar Ali Khan goes to challenge the empire in Britain, hmm. it is Bahadur Shah Zafar who is the emperor sitting in Delhi. All right. So if um, it was the Mughals who gave the English permission to set up trading posts at Surat, right? Yeah. So how did the distribution of power work between the Nawab at, sitting at Surat and the Mughal emperors who were sitting presumably at Delhi? 
Um, so the trading license was given by Emperor Jahangir, you know, sometime in, in the early 1600s, precisely, I would suspect, sometime in 1608. And at that time, Surat had a governor. Mm. Uh, I think it's very important to understand that, you know, what does the word Nawab mean? Mm. Nawab is actually a kind of a rendition of the word Naib. And Naib means governor. So okay. the governor or the Nawab of uh, Surat, who was also called the Mutasaddi, mm. would be based in Surat. He would govern Surat, but he would be obviously reporting to the emperor. Mm. By the time Mir Jafra Ali comes in, you know, Mughal Empire has almost, you know, lost all imperial power. And so every Indian prince has become virtually independent. Right. And so, you know, it's an independent state. Okay. So what happens once Mijaf uh, is driven to the brink of destitution? Well, um, you know, it's quite a catastrophic experience for him and his children. I think it's so important to just take a step back and understand the backdrop, uh, you know, when this this drama plays out. He is in Surat. His wife uh, is suffering from galloping tuberculosis. The couple has just two infant daughters. They're stripped of everything. The English just walk into their palaces, raid their jewelry, raid, you know, their personal possessions, throw them into these, you know, minuscule quarters. And life is utterly miserable. Mir Jafar Ali Khan's Paternal principality is a small principality in Katiawar called Kamandia. Mm -hmm. So he, in his own right, is a ruling prince of this small principality in Kamandia. And that's a cash rich principality. So initially, he's able to raise money to sustain his family mm -hmm. on the back of his small little principality in Katiawar. Katiawar is the region of Gujarat which had a patchwork of tiny principalities. You okay. know? So he belonged to one of them. And he had uh, ruling powers in that little principality of his. But still, you know, uh, you can only put in good money into a sinking ship as much as it can. And the estates of, uh, of Surat were, were sinking dramatically because A, the English had stopped the money, mm. uh, the pension. B, they had usurped every property and every estate. They had flung out and thrown out all the, uh, the, the, the people who were employed by the estates. So you can very well imagine that there comes a point in time where even his paternal principality of Kamandia can't really fund the upkeep of these states. And so he's in debt. He's in considerable amount of debt. And there is no other option but to, you know, be bold and brave uh, and basically do something rather unprecedented, which was to land up in England mm -hmm. and voyage to England in 1844. And how long did that trip take? Well, it took him about a month and a half because mm -hmm. they go all the way through, um, uh, you know, Eden, which is Yemen, mm -hmm. up the Red Sea, uh -huh. into Cairo, park themselves there for a while because you've got to take a breather. And then from Alexandria, uh, sail through the Mediterranean into England. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, against the backdrop of this rather miserable plight of his family, uh, here is a, uh, a prince who's fighting for his rights. He's fighting for the rights of his people and he's fighting for the rights of his infant daughters. Mm. Um, and it's ironic, uh, Hamsini, because what happens is Britain recognizes Queen Victoria mm. as their queen, mm. but they refuse to recognize women's rights in India. Mm. And that was the hypocrisy of the English East India Company. Yeah. That is ironic on many, many levels. Yeah. But then that's colonialism on a plateau. <laughs> Two. At this point, let's take a break. Hi, my name is Anupam Gupta. I'm B50 on Twitter. I am the host of Pesa Pesa, the show that talks money. On my show, I speak to experts from every field of money and finance. From stock markets, equities, debt funds, credit cards, life insurance, every possible area of money and finance that you can think of. We even did an episode on cryptocurrency. I've got fantastic guests from mutual funds to personal finance experts everywhere. robo advisory startups, just name it, we've got it. At Pesa Pesa, we help you make smart decisions about money. You work hard for money. Now make your money work hard for you. New episodes out every Monday and you can listen to my show on the IVM podcast app or any other podcasting app that you have. Pesa Vesa is brought to you by Paytm Money. And we're back after the break. All right. 
So he goes to London. He manages to gain an audience with Queen Victoria. Well, it's not as simple as that. Uh, he he gets to Britain, and he manages to get a few meetings with leading members of Parliament. Mm. And uh, what begins to happen next is that he he starts getting a certain amount of traction. So mm. people start listening to him. And he um, starts breaking into the upper echelons of British, uh, British society and British uh, political establishment. However, while you know, while he's getting a reasonably patient hearing, uh, he's also ruffling a few feathers because you know what he's coming and telling people is that look at what your guys are doing back, you know, in India, conquest at all cost, uh, you know, usurping uh, uh, estates, all of that. And when he starts putting his point of view across, um, he gets a cold shoulder because they very quickly realize that he's, uh, you know, he's challenging what the English East India Company was doing. And the English East India Company is very important to understand are representatives of empire. They are the ones who are expanding empire through conquest. True. And they're also the backbone of the English economy at it, that point. Yeah, absolutely. So all that is being looted out of India is going straight into the coffers mm -hmm. in Britain. Um, so he initially gets a bit of traction, but then when he when they realize that how bold uh, a step he's taken of coming to Britain to expose the English East India Company, you know, a lot of the movers and shakers give him a cold shoulder. Because it's also very important to understand the structure of the English East India Company at that time. It was a corporation. It had investors, stakeholders. And who were these people? They were MPs as well. They were lords, dukes, barons, you know, all of them. So... While the first few months seem rather bleak in prospects, things change quite dramatically when he lands up having a encounter with Victoria, mm. Queen Victoria, at the Royal Ascot, which is the Lotus Star uh, mm. event in the uh, social calendar in Britain. And he's invited there by, by uh, a liberal member of parliament who's quite sympathetic towards him, a gentleman called Robert Pulsford. And during the break in the Ascot uh, racing, Queen Victoria's eyes fall on this 26-year-old Indian prince dressed in these exotic robes and mm. turban. And Victoria, by that time, had developed a real interest in India. Mm. She was not Empress of India as yet, but there was a genuine interest. She wanted to know more about this exotic land that was many miles away. And the English East India Company, you know, the, the malpractices of the company had reached her ears as well. So she, she was quite compassionate towards Indian nobility. So apart from renegading on a lot of treaties, what else was the company accused of in terms of malpractices? Oh, uh, you know, um, outright conquest. For example, you know, um, Lord Ellenborough, who is the one who actually stops the pension mm -hmm. and usurps the estates, uh, actually makes plans to annex Gwalior as well. Yeah. Uh, and he's called back by the English East India Company because he's just so utterly arrogant. He refuses to compromise on anything but conquest. Yeah. Um, so violations of treaty, uh, conquest at all cost, uh, putting in the most ridiculous but lethal policy called the doctrine of lapse, yeah. which basically meant if you are a ruler and you don't have a, a son, yeah. you cannot adopt. You cannot appoint your daughter as a successor and you cannot even have collateral succession, which basically means an uncle's son hmm. could come to the uh, Gaddi. That was also not allowed. Hmm. So it was completely illegal what the English East India Company were up to. And um, so the Ascot meeting kind of changes things for me, Jafar Ali Khan, because at that time, Victoria gives him a patient hearing. Hmm. And um, Prince Albert, who is Victoria's husband, uh, introduces Mir Jafar Ali Khan to two really powerful uh, members of parliament mm. and lawmakers. Mm. Both of these gentlemen are incredibly powerful. One of them is Sir Richard Bethel and the other one is Sir Fitzroy Kelly, deep critics of the English East India Company. And at the same time, uh, incredibly powerful because Sir Richard Bethel is Solicitor General to the Queen. Mm. So, um, you know, they take on his case but he doesn't have the money to continue to stay on and fight, mm. which means he has to return empty-handed to India. And okay. that is what happens in his first visit in 1844. All right. And what prompted him to make the second visit? Um, when he returns to India, um, the English East India Company are actually quite fearful mm. because they suspect that if he returns with a decree, 
you know, uh, stating that his estates have to be restored and his rights of his daughters have to be um, restored and, and, and the pension as well, uh, you know, then they're exposed. Yeah. But when they realize that he comes back empty handed, yeah. they unleash utter hell. What they do is actually, um, it bears testimony to the treachery of the company. They actually pass a special mm -hmm. act in the Bombay Legislative Council, which prevents Mir Jafali Khan from prosecuting them in any courts in India. And it's called the Special Legislative Act of 1848, which basically means our decision mm. of auctioning off these estates is final and you cannot challenge us. You know, basically it means uh, we are lords and masters and um, uh, we've taken this decision and, and there's nothing you can do about it. And they gave themselves immunity mm. towards any kind of challenge in the Indian courts. Mm. And to answer your questions, that is what prompts him back to go back. Mm. Um, and he goes back to England after nine years of just wandering. Mm. You know, he wanders his own paternal state of Kamandia. Uh, remember, he doesn't have a son. Mm. So by that time, the political agency of, of Katiawar Mm. Marks Kamandia also for annexation. Uh. So imagine the situation where he's lost Surat completely. Mm. Kamandia too has been marked for annexation mm. because he doesn't have a son. Uh, and what does he do? You know, he, he puts everything that he has on mortgage. Mm. The lands that he has in Kamandia, the villages that he has there, his own house. And he says the only option now mm. is to go back to England. And when he goes to England again in 1853, uh, nine years after 1844, there's no guarantee of success, mm. which basically means he's taken the greatest gamble of his life. And if he loses in Britain, mm. it's curtains for virtually everything. That is true. But it's also, I think, at least when I was reading it, um, showed you how much he was pushed and how hard he'd been pushed over the years. Yeah, absolutely. That, you know, the English East India Company blocked every road to justice for him in India. They did everything possible to ensure uh, that he cannot win. Mm. When you go to the extent of actually passing an act specifically designed mm. to give yourself immunity mm. so that you can't be challenged in the courts, I mean, how, uh, you know, how arrogant is that? Mm. And that is precisely what they did. And he had been pushed to, a, you know, it was precisely in your words, it was, you know, uh, he, he had been pushed to it and it was back to the wall stuff from, from there on. Um, but I think what, what is so resolute about him is that he's driven at this point in time mm. by the overarching narrative of getting his rights and his mm. daughter's rights. Mm. But he's also driven by another layer within the narrative, which is of really bringing down the colonizing corporation mm. and uh, proving it to the English people that under the name of, you know, British just rule, this is what the company was up to. Mm. So he goes back to London a second time and raises a private member bill, right? And it gets passed. Yes, quite with, with a fair amount of difficulty. Mm. Because, you know, one must remember that it was an unprecedented act to, for mm. an Indian at the peak of empire mm. to get into British Parliament, get a bill tabled and then get it passed. Mm. That meant engaging with the likes of Sir Richard Bethel and Sir Fitzroy Kelly, uh, uh, having a really watertight case, mm. ensuring that every argument was... Um, powerful, articulately uh, expressed, uh, as well as, you know, lobbying MPs who would vote for him. Mm. And that doesn't happen easily. So mm. from 1853 till 1856, it's three years of real hard work, mm. uh, you know, behind closed doors between him and his British allies. He also happens to fall in love at that time. Mm. All right. So what happens once the bill gets passed? What is the bill? What is he petitioning for? So the bill is for two things. Mm. One is the restoration of the 15,000 pounds income, mm. which had been promised from generation to generation in the treaty, mm. and the restoration of the estates. 
um, of Surat, uh, which had been usurped by the uh, English East India Company. Those are the two, you know, uh, cornerstones, if you wish, of the bill. Um, and that is tabled in Parliament. The English East India Company by that time begin to panic because they realize that, you know, they're being exposed mm. in Britain's bastion of law and justice, which he, you know, which Mir Jafar Ali Khan calls it his final frontier. Mm. And he believes that if he wins here, mm. it would be not just a, you know, a historic moment for him, but a historic moment for India, where an Indian has gone into parliament and, and fought mm. the English East India Company on their own home turf. As I mentioned earlier, the English East India Company had their own MPs mm. who are now, you know, put into action to defeat the bill mm. uh, and oppose the bill. And they use every, every trick in the book mm. to delay the bill hearing, to delay uh, the bill going to vote, to try and convince the speaker that it's not articulated well, mm. all of those kind of things. And after, you know, five sessions of intense heated debate, finally, on the 23rd of June, 1856, you know, the speaker of the House of Commons calls for a vote. And uh, it's a resounding victory for uh, an Indian in, in the House of Commons. 213 eyes to 18 no's in a, in a house of 241. What, what I find particularly interesting here is that at this point in time, there's no modern concept of the Indian state as we know it. Right? And uh, there's a mishmash of sovereignties. Who has sovereignty over here? Is it the Nawab? Is it the company? Yeah. Is it Britain? Um, and what I find particularly interesting is Mir Jafar might have been just the smallest actor. Surat might have been a dot on the map. Sure. But what it does is that it sets off a whole chain of events in which, which finally culminates in the end of the East India Company. I think you're, you're absolutely right, uh, Hamsini. That is, um, that is the irony of it all. The English East India Company ships first docked at India's shores in Surat. And it was the case of the Nawab of Surat that spelled their death nail mm. in the House of Commons. But you're absolutely right. It is a mishmash. Mir Jafli Khan is fighting this intense battle in the House of Commons. It's 1856. The East India Company has annexed Awad. So Nawab Wajid Ali Shah has been deposed. They've annexed Sindh. So the Sindh rulers have been deposed. And the Queen of Awad lands up in Britain. Mm. And the princes of Sindh land up in Britain. Mm. And they seek the advice of the Prince of Surat, Mir Jafar Ali, because he's become a symbol of Indian resistance in Britain. And they seek his advice. They seek his knowledge in how to really, you know, challenge the company on their home turf. And, you know, um, because of what happened in Surat, what happened in Awadh, what happened in, you know, Sindh, what happened in Jhansi, India explodes in 1857, uh, which the British call mutiny, but what we proudly call the first war of Indian independence. The story writes itself, um, but how did you go about researching the book? Well, um, I flung myself when the story kind of consumed me because I knew bits and pieces of it because it had been handed down from generation to generation in bits and pieces. But, you know, as I'm kind of aging now, but as a young man, you're more, you know, busy doing other rather ridiculous things. But when I, when I got down to actually um, reading the official minutes of the debate in the House of Commons, yeah. which is, you know, uh, which is a book that my grandfather gave me, um, I was completely moved because the pages are so brittle that even if you turn one page, there is a fear of it tearing, you know, because it's, it dates back to 1856. But I still, you know, I burnt the midnight oil and I read that book. And the minute I put that book down, I was just consumed by the story because it, the debates in Parliament, and when you read my chapter, Heat in Parliament, mm. it is like a courtroom drama where you have this Indian who for the first time enters the House of Commons dressed in a black Sherwani, a black Kamarband and a black turban to show his, you know, kind of um, rejection of empire. Mm. And the minute I read that, I thought, gosh, this story has to be told. But to come to your question, where did I research? I flung myself into the British Library at King's Cross in, um, in London. And the documents there are very well preserved, you know, and they give the complete account of Mir Jafri Khan's stay uh, through his correspondence in Britain 
I was able to unearth some fantastic documents about Surat as a port and how the Nawabs kept writing to the headquarters in Britain, trying to, you know, get their attention to the malpractices of the company in Surat. Uh, I was able to, you know, find an extraordinary amount of documents on Hansard, which is the official parliamentary website for British Parliament. And the entire debate is, you know, played out, uh, kind of available on Hansard. And then, of course, the Asiatic Library here. Uh, and then Surat. All right. This is going to be my last question. If, apart from your book, what would be the one thing that you would recommend people to read or watch if they want to know more about the history of Surat? Well, um, academically, um, purely from an academic standpoint, I would recommend um, a book called Surat, The Mughal Port by a scholar, Ruby Maloney. And she's, uh, you know, a true scholar who understands, um, uh, you know, Surat in its past glory. So I would recommend that book immensely. I would also recommend um, a book called, uh, well, that doesn't necessarily cover Surat. That's all right. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. We, we can cheat a little. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think um, the book by Rosie Llewellyn Jones called The Last King in India talks about the annexation of Awad, okay. which happens in 1856 as well. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, she talks about how the Nawab of Surat was also in Britain fighting his case. So I would recommend those two books. All right. Okay. Thank you so much for speaking to me. Man. Thank you very much. That's it for today's episode of States of Anarchy. Thanks for staying till the end. If you're interested more about Surat or its place in maritime history or what happened with Meet Jafar Ali Khan, I've attached a bunch of readings for you in the podcast description. If you have any comments or questions, you can reach out to me on Twitter, where I'm at the rate Hamsini H, or on Instagram, at the rate States of Anarchy. You can listen to States of Anarchy on the IVM podcast app, website, or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'll be back next Tuesday. Hello, everybody. We have a brand new daily podcast we're working on with Bloomberg Quint. All You Need to Know provides the top news on business, markets, and the economy so that you can stay ahead of the curve. Tune in every morning on BloombergQuint.com, the IVM podcast app, or wherever you get your podcasts from. Have you gotten yourself a gym membership and shown up only a few times? Are long working hours cutting your fitness goals short? How about you change things a little? Even a small effort can make a big difference. And I'll tell you how and what exactly. Hi guys, I'm Coach Urmi and on the Kinetic Living Podcast, you can look forward to some interesting stories of people who have changed the way they look at fitness after their kinetic journeys. Episodes out every Wednesday on the IVM app, website and anywhere you get your podcast from.